This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. We're in the waning days before Lent. The great fast begins in just a few short days. And so I thought I would turn our attention to one of the great teachers of the faith from the late 19th and early 20th century, Monsignor Ronald Knox, who was a scholar of a great many different biblical areas and was responsible for the translation of the Bible into English in the 20th century in a translation that is liked by many traditionalists, though not for more hardcore study, but very good for typical the average Catholic's needs every day needs for reading. If you are interested, you can look up the Knox translation of the Bible. I believe Baronius Press has it for sale. I have one at home, along with a Dewey Rames, which is what I use for work on the channel and other things most of the time. But here he is going to teach about the meaning of the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and at the very beginning of this. This is a the beginning of a multi-part series of Hill of covering what he has to say on the Sermon on the Mount. And here you're going to see the begin the first line from the Sermon on the Mount that is so important. So please let's turn our attention to Monsignor Ronald Knox. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to them that they hate you, and pray for them that persecute you and calumniate you. For if you love them that love you, what reward shall you have? Do not even the publicans this. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more? Do not also the heathens this. See Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. If you read our Lord's words as a command that must be obeyed to the letter, as an obligation which binds upon your conscience under some, penal some penalty, they can only involve you in scruples and disquiet. Does our Lord really command us to loose ourselves in admiration of a particular person's qualities, just because he happens to have done us a bad turn? Does he order us, on pain of his displeasure, to feel a violent attraction towards the people who do nothing but spurn our advances? Are we never to have time or money to spend on our relations, our benefactors, on the people who are fond of us, because we are so busy paying court to people who cannot bear the sight of us? Plainly, we are misrepresenting him if we suppose that he means our lives to be regulated on such principles as that. And if you look at a book of moral theology, you will be appalled at the effect which is produced by the attempt to work out these various verses into a system or code of behavior. You will be told that a Christian is bound under pain of mortal sin to accord to his enemy the common courtesies of life, not to refuse him recognition, for example, in public. Is that all that is meant by the Sermon on the Mount? Why, no, but that is all that moral theology can, in fairness, assist upon. That is all you will get out of the Sermon on the Mount if you insist on treating it as a piece of legislation, as a series of commands which must be obeyed. The secret of our Lord's new law, as I have been trying to show you, is that it is not a series of commands which must be obeyed, but an active principle of charity which ought to make commands unnecessary for us. The quotation which he gives here from the Old Testament is not an exact quotation. It is rather an exposition of the text. The law said, Thou shalt love thy friend as thyself. It seems that in the context, the word friend here meant to indicate a fellow member of our Lord's people, as opposed to the foreigner and the Gentile. And our Lord says, Surely this is very extraordinary, that there should have to be a law which commands a man to love his friends, obviously implying that he need be at no pains to love his enemies. Why should we need a law on such a point of view as that? To sympathize with your fellow countrymen, to be chatting on terms with your neighbors, to make little presents and perform little services for your friends, why natural inclination is enough to make a man do all that. Do not even the publicans, for all their sordid minds and their grasping habits, go out of their way to do a good turn to a friend. Do not the Gentiles, with no law of Moses to guide them, pass kind words to one another. To do so much as that, it is not necessary to be a disciple of Moses, far less a disciple of the Sermon on the Mount. I think our Lord means us to see that means us to see that the love and kindness which we bestow on our friends is not in itself the result of any law which enjoins such conduct. It comes quite natural to us. We do it from inclination. Now, the disciples of the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us in this passage, will be the children of their Father in heaven, who makes his Son rise upon the good and the bad, and reigns upon the just and the unjust. The children of their Father, then they will imitate their Father. 
They will imitate the splendid promiscuousness of his gen generosity. They, in their turn, will show love and kindness, not measuring it out in the scales or feeling obliged by a law, but naturally from inclination. Only they will not, like our elder brothers or the heathen, be moved by such to such expressions of affection, only by men of their own kindred or men of their own race. All mankind will be their nation. Every class of mankind will be their kindred. The saints will expect no more reward for tending lepers than you would expect for looking after some relation of yours who should fall ill in the next street. The saints will not feel that he has done something handsome in pardoning his would-be ender that then you would feel had you done something handsome in accepting an apology for some friend you may have quarreled with. Man's love for his friends, though it be enjoined by law, is not dictated to him by law. It springs from a natural inclination. A man's love for his enemies is not dictated to him by a law either. It springs from a supernatural inclination. That is the secret of the Sermon on the Mount. It is a very common thing to find people really worried about their attitude in this matter. They say, I know the gospel tells us to forgive our enemies, but I can't do it. So-and-so has done them an injury, or worse, still has done an injury to the one they loved, and the wound will not stop rankling. Of course, I pray for him, and they will tell you, when I meet him, I do my best to be civil to him, and I try not to talk about him behind his back. In fact, I think I succeed more or less in behaving as if I'd forgiven him, but I haven't forgiven him, really. Deep down in my heart, there are the same smoldering fires of anger, and every time I think of the name, even in prayer, it only serves to fan those smoldering fires into a blaze. Now, what am I to do about it? Ought I go to the communion, when I still feel like this? Are my confessions really valid when I tell myself I have forgiven, and tell the priest that I have forgiven, but feel sure all the time that I am not speaking from my heart? Can our Lord really tell us to forgive our enemies? Doesn't he mean simply that we ought to behave as if we would forgiven them? Well, for purposes of moral theology, that's perfectly true. There can be no obligation to feel affected in a particular way toward our neighbor, if only because our affections do not come and go like that at the command of the will. The most that can be commanded of us as a matter of obligation is that we should bottle up our feelings of resentment. The best test of whether we are doing that or not is the success with which we manage to conceal them. I don't think there's any reason to feel guilty about our resentment if we're really doing our best to live it down. But there is, I think, reason to feel humiliated. Humiliated because we are so unlike the Sermon on the Mount. You see, our Lord doesn't tell us to forgive our enemies. Nothing as simple as that. He tells us to love our enemies. You haven't done his whole will for you when you've stopped hating your enemies. He wants you to love them. And of course, you don't. But then, that's all part of a much bigger question. You say you don't love your enemies. I know, but do you love your grocer? Do you love the blind man at the corner of the road? Why, no. There are probably only about two or three hundred people in the world of whom you could definitely say, I like them. Of course, you don't love your enemies if you haven't even learned to love strangers. You see, that's where the saints differ from us in their attitude towards mankind. They really do love their fellow man as such. They feel the same thrill of pleasure when they see a man coming down the road, which you and I feel when we see a friend coming down the road. Mankind is their kindred, the world is their parish. And consequently, one who shows bitter enmity towards a saint speaks evil of him, persecutes him, it is to the saint simply a friend who is being tiresome. It's a sort of tiff between lovers which is bound to blow over. I know the lives will always tell us that saints love their enemies as being instruments of their own mortification. And I dare say that's true, but that's not all the truth. They didn't love them for being instruments. They loved them for being men. I doubt it's possible for a human being to love everybody in a completely impartial way. Our Lord himself loved St. John especially, and surely Our Lady claimed a unique place in the affections of his sacred heart. The trouble with us mostly is not that we spend so much love on our relations and friends, but that we haven't begun to love mankind in general at all. But that is what we ought to ask for, and hope for, as a result of trying to imitate our Lord. Not a spiritless indifference to the hatred and ill usage of our fellow men, but an all-embracing love of our fellow men so hearty, so boisterous, that no amount of insult, no amount of ingratitude, can conquer its irresistible optimism. Did you find that challenging? Not to understand, but like, convicting. Did you find that sense convicting? that how most of us fail to most basic need to love our enemies. That we don't even necessarily go beyond liking our neighbors, so how could we possibly love our enemies? It's an interesting thought, especially at a time where the church seems assailed by 
different enemies of all kinds from outside the church and within that we are still to love the people who do that, those things to the church. I found it particularly convicting. And I wonder if you did too. Let me know what you thought of that in the comments. Is this a challenging thing to hear from a priest that we are to love those who have no love for us? It is a, it is something that we should ponder as we get ready for Lent. Let me know what you thought of this reading in the comments, please, and hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It certainly does help. So to share this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.